four minutes down. down. So, uh, hello. Uh, I hope you've had fun the first set of workshops. Yeah? yeah. yeah. feeling inspired on that. So, I, I've been asked to talk about the educational context. And um, so, how many people have run, already run a prayer space of some sort? Yeah. So, uh, so you, you probably already know this. So, uh, <clears throat> so in the room here, we'll, we're probably a, a bit of a gathering of experts, really. If you've already run a prayer space, you'll know a bit about this. Uh, who works in a school regularly? Okay, so, um, right. So now I'm feeling really intimidated because you probably know loads more than I do about all this. Or if we collected, what would be better would be if we collected all of our wisdom into one place, we'd probably all learn loads. So let's do that, yeah? So chip in with, with stuff as we go along. Um, I was going to, so I'm going to talk about the, the context of running a prayer space in a school. So how the educational context connects with, with that. And uh, you probably already know most of this. I just thought I'd start with, with this. Like, because when we go into school, to work in a school, um, the educational context is so much more vast than the prayer space that we've come in to run. And we're passionate about the prayer space, and we know all about it, and that's what we want to see happen in the school. The school wants to come and do it, and we're kind of really up for it. And so this is just a random, you can take a photo if you like, but this is just a random selection of things that I'm, I'm aware of that are agendas for schools at the moment. So the whole fundamental British values thing, yeah? So schools have to teach... So schools become repositories for all sorts of any societal ill that crops up. Um, the government you know, dictates then that this needs then to be dealt with by schools. So schools end up being a container for all sorts of strategies and provisions and policies and directives to try and deal with ills that are happening beyond their borders. But anyway, fundamental British values, we now have to teach fundamental British values. Um, there's a, a school that we work in, and there's this fantastic set of posters, I can't remember who publishes them, there's about 30 or 40 of them, because no one's actually said what fundamental British values are. Have you noticed that? Yeah. yeah. There's not like a top 10 list. <laughs> Nobody's actually said what they are. But there's this, 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 this company that produced all these posters, all sorts of things on it, including things like guns are not part of everyday life. You know? we, we queue quite well. <laughs> you know, <I'm> <laughs> queue. It's not like this. Um, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. Um, so, things like, so all of these. Th these are kind of British values, aren't they? They're probably not the ones the government was thinking about, but I love, I love them those. So there's the these posters on the wall. We go and have a chuckle when we read them. Um, so, but as that, it's the, the prevent agenda, which becomes, uh, which became law on the first of July. So uh, this is to prevent extremism. But again, it's a really contentious kind of idea. Um, obviously, nobody wants um, uh, terrorists to be learning their trade in schools, or whatever. But uh, yeah. Is, is this going to work? I don't know. Um, FGM, so female genital mutilation, schools are now supposed to be on the lookout, particularly during the summer term, for girls that are likely to be uh, taken on holiday to other countries where FGM is, is practiced, and uh, schools are now supposed to be on the alert to identify any girls that might be um, a victim of FGM. Uh, of course, there's a whole sex education, um, and uh, particularly child sexual exploitation, and, uh, and now there's uh, people arguing that schools should be teaching about consent. So there are now some, uh, some organisations and trusts and educational um, providers now doing stuff about consent because schools need to be doing that. Class of behaviour is always an ongoing one. It probably was in your day, um, and it probably still, and it still is. So, but uh, low-level disruption and uh, how you deal with low-level disruption and things. There are teacher shortages, and certainly in maths and RE, that I'm aware of, that are other subjects that are really struggling at the moment. Science, I think, is not, it's not doing well either. And, it, and so these are, you know, these are key subjects, and there aren't the teachers. So that's another struggle for schools, is finding people. Uh, and then there's a the whole thing about children and young people's mental health. And I think this is, I was chatting to, to Jill earlier, and there's this massive discontinuity between the, the school's agenda, which is about getting people to get grades so they can get jobs, so they can be economically productive, um, sort of top down. Whereas teachers are struggling with the real day-to-day -day reality of young people's mental health and the stresses that young people are going through, not just because of the education system, but because of other societal pressures. Uh, social media and the internet bullying. If you work in a school, uh, so one of the schools where we work, there was a, a whole, um, I can't remember the exact details, but a whole thing got around Facebook, which was to do with one family in the school slagging off another family in the school on Facebook outside the school, but what then happened was that, that the, the refruit of that came into the school in the tension and turmoil that was going on 
between groups of students in school. It's nothing that the school had any handle on. They couldn't, there's nothing really they could do about it, apart from trying to address the behaviour issue that was going on at school. But actually the behaviour issue was just the fallout from this massive thing that was going on on social media beyond their borders. Um, yeah, um, and uh, for teachers as well, teachers are, are commonly victims of all sorts of uh, very unsavory things happening on, on social media. Um, there are secularising agendas, so there are there are forces at work to uh, try and strip out any aspect of faith within um, the work of schools, uh, in the sort of ostensibly so that education is totally neutral as far as faith goes, except that's not really possible, but um, for Christians working in schools, remember our context here is running a prayer space in the school, there are those that would wish that we that this wasn't permitted, um, or that it was so regulated by some sort of, di sort of policy that it's actually emasculated it from any, any, having any real spiritual value. And then the schools can cope with EBAC, uh, which again Jill mentioned briefly, so this is the English Baccalaureate, I was thinking it's a bit of a joke really, because it's not a proper Baccalaureate, it's really just pick, cherry picking five what the government sees as the top subjects, and if you if you work in a school that has any connection with music or art or RE, you'll know that those subject areas are really struggling because they're um, they're not the favoured subjects. And so um, schools, EBAC has been voluntary up to now, but from September next year, I think it is, it becomes compulsory, and, one, and every school has to um, ensure that students do maths, science, English. Humanities, geography, or history, but not Marine, um, and um, a modern language. Um, now, are you still statutory at the moment? Yeah, I was going to say that's the one yeah. of our compulsory yeah. GCSEs. Um, so it's not it. right. They might do in your school. It's not compulsory as a GCSE anywhere else. But the weird thing is that the number of students opting to take RE yeah. is, is, is rising. So. Um, the final, you know, the final decision may not yet have been made, but again, there's a pressure on schools and for our role in delivering stuff that might have a spiritual uh, value to it, um, that, that comes under pressure from there. So, uh, here's uh, three ways in which um, prayer spaces contribute to the life of schools. Uh, first one is spiritual, moral, social and cultural development, which as uh, I guess you know, schools are required to demonstrate. Uh, this has been, this was uh, originally um, set up, 2004 was the original SMSC document, mm. and then it was revised in 2012, the, the requirement for SMSC was, was heightened, and then 2013 there was further guidance which made it an even more important part of the school. So, um, a school uh, won't be judged as outstanding if it is not um, doing well in its SMSC. So it could be outstanding in lots of areas, but if the SMSC is, is poor, they won't get an outstanding rating. So it actually carries quite a lot of weight in the life of the school. And, um, it's, but it's something that's not a subject, it's, it's to do with the whole ethos and um, uh, culture of the school. And it's supposed to be expressed in all sorts of different areas, so in subject areas and in non-curriculum non areas as well. So, what's it look like? Well, evidence of pupils' spiritual, moral, social, and cultural development can be found, for example, where pupils are reflective about beliefs, values, and more profound aspects of human experience using their imagination and creativity and developing curiosity in their learning. Pretty much defines prayer space, doesn't it? Yeah? Prayer spaces definitely do that. And so, we know that we're making a contribution to SMSC in schools when we do this. Has anybody had Ofsted in? when they've been running a prayer space. Has that happened to any of you? No, we've had it twice so far, and um, they rate prayer spaces as outstanding. Uh, it's happened to other people that we know of as well, and whenever Ofsted turn up and there's a prayer space going, so far they've rated what's happening as an outstanding contribution to the SMSC. It's not about ticking boxes, but it is about making a contribution, and uh, this, this makes a good contribution. Here's a few examples of things using uh, uh, so, prayer wall might be a good example of spiritual development as shown by their beliefs, religious or otherwise, which inform their perspective on life and their interest in and respect for different people's feelings and values. So, uh, uh, prayer wall where young people can express their, their beliefs and other young people can read them and hopefully they show respect for different people's feelings and values. So, all of this I've lifted from our document. So, there's a document on the Prayer Space and Schools website, 
about SMSC and press bases. Um, and so this is really just lifting information from that. Perhaps the sorry activity is an example of moral development, as shown by their ability to recognise the difference between right and wrong and their readiness to apply this understanding in their own lives. I'm sorry for not appreciating all that you've done for me. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, um, culture development. So this is a press base in a primary school near us recently. Uh, this is the one, the homeless box one, that uh, again is on the, on the press base in school's website, the resources there. G giving young people a chance to, or children here, a chance to think about um, the lives of other people, poverty. Uh, they linked it, in fact, to the charity. This school supports Send a Cow, the charity is Send a Cow. And they used it, um, they linked it with that as well. Um, but the person who ran this said there were, said there were cases when there were children who, who did this activity and, and came out of the cardboard box in tears because they said, I hadn't realised what life's like for some people, but now I do. That's good. So the cultural development showed by addressing discrimination on the grace of grounds of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, and other criteria, and promoting racial and other forms of equality. So just helping young people be aware. And we, we say, when, if you're running a press space, make sure there's some kind of justice activity that's in there somewhere. Something that takes young people beyond themselves. Because quite a lot of what goes on in a press space is about our own life and our own uh, reactions to things. Uh, and that's good. There's the pastoral um, aspect to it as well. We don't want it to be just about that. It's not all about me. We want young people to think beyond as well. So uh, we'd say we'd try and have a something that links to justice so that young people are, are thinking beyond themselves and uh, empathising with those uh, that don't have what they need. Uh, but SMSC is not just about the religious side of things. So we've tried to create activities that connect with other aspects of, of the curricular life of the school. So when we created Sanctum, our press space in Colchester in 2008, we uh, we deli deliberately set it up as a, as a spiritual development resource rather than an RE resource. We didn't do it to go to RE. And for the first three, all we did was we were only open break time and lunch time. So it was an entirely voluntary activity for students to come to. So we were getting over 100 students coming through in a week, just choosing to come in, but we weren't doing any lessons. And then we kind of got slightly hijacked by the RE department, which we're really, really pleased about, um, because that means that students come in and do this, um, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. But about why that's good. But <clears throat> we want it to be not just about RE, we want it to be about other subjects as well. So I spoke to a science teacher and I said, how can we help spiritual development in science? How can we do something in, in the prayer space that reflects stuff that you're doing in science and that will help uh, young people to kind of reflect on it rather than just thinking about it? And he said, well, I've got a real... We, we try to talk to them about space about the size of space, but it's really difficult to get them, they just kind of go, yeah, so what? Uh, but I, I, I wish that they could, they could kind of feel it somehow, and um, that they could be encouraged to respond to the bigness of space. So I said, okay, we'll make an activity about that. So this one here, you can just about see there's a 50-inch TV in there, which we hired for a week from somebody who does sound like. And, um, we uh, found a video about the, that starts with Earth and comes all the way, draws all the way out to the edge of the universe and then goes back in again and then all the way down to the sub-molecular level. It takes about four minutes to do that. Um, and, uh, and we top and tailed it with some, some pictures and some narration that just uh, gets young people thinking about um, their, their place in the site, in, in the midst of all of this. And it quotes that bit from Psalms. Uh, what is, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Um, so, a uh, quote a little bit of scripture, and then the response bit to it which says, um, how does this make you feel? Write your thoughts on one of the star shapes. So we bought a punch that punches out star shapes out of card, and we got a fluorescent card, and punch star shapes out of it, and they're held together with treasury tags, so those little tags with a thing in there, uh, and because uh, they're fluorescent, we've got a UV light to hang up so they will glow and things, so it's all kind of quite touchy-feely, and that's a bit, so uh, we love work. But, so this activity was created to connect with something that science were already doing, so that we could, in, in the press space, we can have something that gives young people a chance to respond and reflect spiritually about something that is scientific, so, which is, in a way, that the science teacher can't do, because that's not 
not because you're not allowed to, but there just isn't space in the curriculum to allow for this kind of wonder moment. This was massively, the, the, the students really, really like this. Um, uh, and some of the responses are amazing. It made me feel so small. It made me wonder, yeah. And some of them were so, like, I was amazed. It just amazed me to think that God still sees me. Um, this is in a state school. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one attempt. Um, this one started by accident. So we, um, uh, we were setting up a prayer space, we put up this world map and we hadn't put any instructions on it because we ran out of time. And the first class came in. And um, so they did all the activities that had the instructions on them. And once, once they finished and gone out, we discovered there were these post-it notes over it. So we had the post-it notes. And the students themselves had started using this, this map as a place, it, it became a litany for all the things that are wrong in the world. Um, but, and so we just let, let them do it. So we just let it, let it kind of carry its own meaning. And a humanities teacher came down who teaches RE and geography. And she looked at it and she went, this is amazing. She said, this is transferable learning taking place here. Yeah? We said, what do you mean? So, well, these things that they've written about, we've, we've been studying these in geography this last year. Um, but now they're, um, they're, they're reflecting on them and reflecting on the meaning behind some of these things. So it was covered with uh, it, things to do with environmental geography, where man is trashing the world. It was to do with, with, with social geography, where people are being disadvantaged and injustices are going on. Um, uh, so all sorts of... Um, uh, and then big question things about you know, why, why earthquakes and stuff like that. So we, we adopted it and we actually turned it into a proper activity by writing some instruction cards for it. But so that connected with geography, and again, she, and the teacher was absolutely delighted because what it demonstrated to her was her, uh, her students were thinking spiritually about some of the issues they were studying in geography. Now, I'm on the, I'm on the track to sort out something for maths. I want to get something going for maths, but it's because I think, yeah, what, what does maths do? But maths, I think, maths is an intriguing, there's, a, there's intrigue and there's wonder in the way that maths works. So I'll try and create an activity for that, but I haven't done that yet. But you see, this is our, our faltering attempts to create stuff that, that addresses spiritual, moral, social, and cultural um, development, but specifically targeting non-religious subjects, so that we're bringing, sp bringing spiritual life into those subjects. And we're helping those teachers in those areas to demonstrate SMSC in their subject area, uh, especially if it's a difficult one. We'll do the thinking and creating the thing, and that helps them out. So SMSC is one of the ways in which we connect with the context of education. Um, Regulus education, how much time is that? 35. 35, okay. Um, Religious education, obviously, as I said, when we started running craft spaces, they were slightly hijacked by RE. Has that happened for you? That anybody running craft spaces, do you have any RE classes coming in? No. If you have classes coming in, what, so have, what, what classes are they? I have RE classes coming in. Do you have other classes as well, or is it technically just only? No other classes as well. Oh, right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, well, we have the whole, whole school, so yeah. they, they timetable the um, program. So, like, you know, whatever class you were in, year eight was in doing, so if it was geography, it was geography, it was science. It was a, oh. So they, they just wrote a time, to, you know, time table so every class came, and it just did whatever subject it was, it just hit that subject. Brilliant. A bit random. Yeah, but what I love about that, so that's um, whatever work class was timetable, they just came down into the, yeah. the press space. Uh, so that's great, because what the school's saying is this is a whole school thing, and actually it's not linked to any particular subject area, this is just a good thing for us to be doing. That's really good, yeah. Uh, in practice, our experience has been that it's, uh, for classes coming in, it tends to be RE, just because the RE teachers will go, right, here's our timetable for the week, we'll get, get them in. And, of course, it links to prayer. So... Um, there are various key concepts. Uh, um, RE is locally determined through um, Standing Advisory Council for Religious Education, which will be different for different areas. But there is a, a, a bunch of kind of key uh, aspects of RE that need to be covered. One of them, key concept, meaning, purpose, and truth. So exploring some of the ultimate questions that confront humanity and responding imaginatively to them. So that's part of what RE is supposed to do. You could be argued that the questions activity has got to exist helps to fulfil that for our re. Um, we can't. Uh, let me know when you're done. Uh, there we go. Um, <laughs> key process two, 
to unlearning. So uh, RE does two things, learning about religion and learning from religion. So learning about religion is learning about Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, whatever. Um, uh, and uh, so people should be able to investigate the impact of religious beliefs and teachings on individual communities and societies. This could include, for example, investigating the reasons for prayer and collecting the source of information on worship rituals. So when you're running a prayer space, uh, having RE groups coming in is good RE because it helps them to investigate prayer. One of the things I'll say uh, in the introduction is uh, to the students is uh, this gives you a chance to uh, think about your life in a perhaps in a more spiritual way, but also it gives you a chance to think about what prayer might be like for people who pray because some of these activities might be quite like prayer. So we're not asking you to be religious or to believe something you don't believe. But, but, but some of these activities will be quite like what people might do when they pray. Have a think as you go around. See if there are any here that you think might be like what prayer is like. So you're, you're asking them to treat it almost like a laboratory to go and find out, as an exploration, to find out what, um, what of these activities are like prayer. And I'll sometimes ask them at the end, were there any activities here that you thought were a bit like prayer? Apart from the prayer wall, because that's too obvious, you're not allowed to mention that. So then I'll talk about the forgiveness activity. Say, so that's probably quite like prayer, because it's about asking for forgiveness. Uh, or go, well, the sorry one, because it's like kind of confessing and stuff. Or the letting go activity, where they write what they're worried about and fold it up and stick it in the box. You know, it's like, it's like letting the worries go to God. So what we're helping them to do is to think about uh, what prayer is like, uh, uh, without making them do any particular kind of ritual. Uh, this one, this is an activity, we, we did this almost as a dare, really. So glass beads, so like jars, most glass jars, glass beads, you can buy a, uh, of auntie pretty shops or whatever, uh, and a bowl and a card, which has got a verse from Revelation about how we um, uh, God uh, takes the prayers of the saints and they fill the bowls of incense in heaven. And uh, we just said, what you know, what do you, what would you like to pray for? Hold a bead as you pray, and once you've prayed, drop it in the bowl. So we're in, working in state schools with large non-Christian pupils. And a number of times you see young people that they take, they took this more seriously than to our shame, we believed they would. We thought, we, weren't, we really weren't sure whether this was going to work. But another, they found it really, really helpful just to hold on to something, to pray, and then, then to put it in the bowl, to say, I've done it, I've prayed for that. Um, one of my <laughs> favourite moments of this, actually, in the school, this is, uh, there were two lads, and one of them was, because they're very tactile, just swirling his hand around in the glass piece. You can imagine, that, yeah, it feels good. And his mate next to him said, Careful, said those are people's prayers. Interesting, isn't it? So we're uh, learning about religion. So a prayer space helps young people to learn about religion. But obviously we're doing that in a way that is has is open-ended and accessible and isn't forcing them into um, having to believe something they don't want to believe. Um, but then the other one, key process two two, is learning from religion. So we, we look at religion and we learn things from it. Uh, people should be able to reflect on the relationship between beliefs, teaching, world issues, and ultimate questions. This should include issues such as peace, conflict, wealth, poverty, and the importance of the environment. Here's our justice activity, which is to do with this is to do with stop the traffic. So we have uh, printed out some information for stop the traffic. Um, students are asked to write their thoughts or prayers. So they might not be a praying type, in which case they can write their thoughts, can't they? So they write their thoughts or prayers onto a strip of paper, and then to fold it into a paper chain and it up. So paper chains are kind of a symbolic thing going on there. So it looks lovely by the end of the week, but all these paper chains hanging up. Um, mm -hmm. and it's quite difficult to read them during the week, but we get back to the office and undo all the paper clips very laboriously and read them. And oh my goodness, like the, the responses of young people to this is often overwhelming. Like over half of them are, their response is just incredibly heartwarming and genuine and quite insightful. They really mean it. So, <clears throat> Uh, and in that sense, we're learning, I suppose, learning from religion. Um, uh, thinking about ultimate questions. What do religious people believe about these things? What can I learn from it? So, <clears throat> uh, so religious education. So, obviously, in the context of uh, education, that works. The other, I think, key area where press spaces make a big difference is well-being and mental health. And um, uh, it has pastoral benefits. Um, We've had, this is a part of one part of an activity that we've put together using big metal tubing and black drapes and things, and it's about identity. I mean, the, the narration talks them around um, some different, uh, four different sections. They, they, think, they look in a the mirror, they think about how 
other people see them, they think about how they see themselves, and they think about how God sees them. Uh, you have a hope in the future, you're amazingly wonderfully made, you're loved and valued. Um, and then uh, they have a look at a, third, a, a final mirror, which, and they write three things about themselves that they're really pleased about. So, um, uh, yeah, won't work with, so it asks them about three specific different things. So they write on those, they look at them, and then they rub them off, only they know what they wrote. Um, when they walk out of this, that most young people come and go, that's amazing. Or they go, wow, I feel so much better. And in feedback, this gets loads of hits from young people that say, um, it really helped me uh, with my confidence, it helped me be sure about who I am. I feel much more, um, uh, much more secure about my identity, those sorts of things. We had somebody who's looking after this activity, handing out the MP3 players and collecting them in again. And uh, it was the first time they'd come to our prayer space, and they were looking at, looking at these students coming out, and they said, they came over to me and said, when they come out, they're taller, aren't they? They come out taller. The, just the, the confidence in these things. That's about well-being and mental health. You have other activities that, that do that. Um, we know that the forgiving activity, um, hold a stone that represent the hurts that have been done to you. If you want to let it go, you can either put it back on the pile of stones, or if you want to let go of the hurts, you can drop it in the bucket of water. Um, we've had young people in tears with this because, uh, as one lad said to me, said, I finally felt I was able to let go of something I've been holding on to since primary school. So he was a year nine. Um, we had uh, two girls, one I mean, a bit more weepy on the shoulder than another one. And um, when asked, are these happy tears or sad tears? She said, they're happy tears because I finally felt I could let go of something. Again, in the feedback forms, we see that uh, lots and lots and lots of young people say, I like the forgiving activity because I finally felt I could let go of something about being a mental health. Um, we we'll recommend having a, a forgiving activity in there. Um, we do uh, this activity called character where they, uh, normally with two students, not three, uh, they choose two, a whole load of cards in here, 20 cards, fruits of the spirit, a few other things, all good stuff, and they have to choose the two cards that best describe their friend. So they pick those two cards out, and then you have a conversation about it. And um, so their friend gets to hear them, hear their, hear their other friend telling them about all the good qualities they see in them. And they love it because they're being affirmed and encouraged. And uh, is this prayer? I'm not sure it's prayer, but it's the spiritual discipline of encouragement. So we're teaching skills about, about encouragement. And uh, it's great for young people's sense of well-being and self-esteem. So um, uh, you could, that's an easy one to do something like that. Um, so we know it makes a difference. But, um, I'm, <clears throat> so the context of education press space is absolutely fit in with the context of education. But I'm now going to unravel something of what I've just said because we've talked about SMSC, we've talked about um, RE, um, the whole issue of well-being and mental health for young people, which is um, that schools recognise a need for and welcome press spaces as a way of helping meet that need. Um, but we need to be um, aware that Actually, most prayer spaces don't happen because somebody went to a school and said, we can help you with your SMSC by running a prayer space, or we can help you with RE uh, by running a prayer space. Uh, most people run a prayer space because they have a, already have a connection, a relationship with the school, and they offer a prayer space, and the, the, the staff you're speaking to get what this thing will do for young people, and how much it fills out the gap in what schools, what teachers wish they could provide, but they can't because of the pressures that we looked at at the beginning, all the expectations from government, from parents, from others, um, to have to produce exam results. And um, teachers know that their students need more than that, and that's why they welcome press spaces in. You know, <clears throat> SMSC might be with us for a long time, but there might be some government policy that comes along and does away with SMSC and replaces it with something else. Earlier this year, the government put out uh, put up some funding bids for character education. You heard about character education? So in January, they gave people only two weeks to bid for it, but you could bid for between 50,000 and 350,000 pounds to run some pilot work on character education. Because suddenly the government thought, we need to try and instill character in our young people. And so, uh, <laughs> thank you, that's great, isn't it? So uh, people were invited to bid for money to be able to run these pilot projects. And I've looked through it, because we run some projects that are to do with character, um, but we weren't going to go near it. Uh, we didn't have time to put a bid in, and it was too much money for, to cope with anyway for us. But uh, as part of the remit, the government would then have permission to use all of your 
material and feedback and everything from that. So it was basically what they're wanting, and I understand their, their <laughs> point of view, is they wanted people to um, try these things out, tell us what works, and then we can start to mandate. So, and so there has been some suggestion, one of the, one of the organisations, the companies that, that bid for this money and ransom parlours, Suggest, uh, in their feedback, they suggested that character education might be a good replacement for SMSC. Now, whether the government picks up on that and decides on it, it's probably unlikely. But you never know when the next policy might come along. So, does anybody remember SEAL? Uh, Social and Emotional Aspects of Learning. Yeah? So that's been, that's been almost discredited in some research that was done uh, a little while ago that suggested that at best it was neutral, so it was neutral, and uh, suggested that it might actually be uh, disempowering of young people um, <clears throat> and uh, destructive of authority between staff and pupils. Well, that's, that sounds like it's part of the, the sort of, kind of new agenda towards the Chinese style teaching style. Um, but, so SEAL is pretty much vaporised really, although I know that there are staff that still uh, want to work with it because actually they see it's really good. Hmm? Still use a lot. Still yeah, yeah. So although it's sort of slipped off the official agenda, schools are still using it because it's good stuff. So does anybody remember Every Child Matters? Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, remember that? Yeah, it's a, a brilliant. I mean, five brilliant, brilliant. That was really, really well worked out. But you don't hear anything about that anymore. So these things can come and go, and um, SMSC could come and go. RE is under under a lot of pressure. Uh, there are those that would want RE to be. Uh, and there are some quite high level academic reports floating around in government about what to do about RE, to change RE so that it's no longer religious education, but it's something else within which there is an, there's a component that helps young people to understand about faiths and society and stuff like that. But it, it might, it, you could imagine it could conceivably end up being something like sort of um, cultural studies sort of thing, with, so we understand other cultures. You know, that's, that would be people's agenda. So, RE is under some pressure, but there's also some counter pressure because young people are choosing it. It's kind of a bit embarrassing, really. They're opting to do this, so it's quite popular. So, we have to be careful that we don't think that prayer space is the answer to a particular uh, educational kind of uh, policy or, or subject area or something. That's an answer to them all, not a particular one. Sorry? So, it's the answer to them all, not just a particular one. That's it, yeah. But actually, we know this is good news for schools, it's good news for children and young people. Um, so uh, we can have confidence that what we're delivering is what's needed, because it doesn't have to fit to an agenda. A bit like Jill was saying earlier, uh, you know, the, loss of economic, the education agenda is driven out by economics, but actually what that does is it strips out our, our God-given humanity. And that's the bit that we're, we're, that's the need that we're meeting. And that need will never go away. Whatever schools look like, whatever education looks like, whatever the educational context looks like, people still need to know that they're loved, that they're valued, and they have a place to be real about the things that are going on in their life. So, uh, so carry on doing what you're doing. Never. Yeah.